At a point about three miles west of Barnesville, Georgia, there sits, at the top of a hill, a home that is notable. Built in about 1825 by a man called Benjamin Gashett, it is said to have served as one of the locations that the Revolutionary War hero, the Marquis de Lafayette, visited on his tour of the United States in that same year. Now, as you might imagine, Gashett was an interesting guy. Born a member of the French nobility, he had moved to Santo Domingo at some point and then fled that Caribbean island due to the ongoing Haitian Revolution and landed in Georgia. After bouncing around a bit and getting married, he won a 202-acre plot of land in the newly formed Pike County through the 1821 Georgia Land Lottery. The house he built on the land is exceptional as an exemplar of what is known as early-style plantation architecture with dual fireplaces, one on either end of the home, and front rooms with separate entrances to host guests. Over the course of my nearly two decades living just a few miles from the Gashett house, I must have ridden my bicycle past the corner it sat on at the intersection of Georgia Highway 18 and Piedmont and Five Points Roads hundreds if not thousands of times. On any number of those passages, I wondered why the house was built where it was and why it had survived when so many other homes built during that same period had not. One reason I think was pretty obvious. It was on a hill, a fact that I never failed to appreciate as I pedaled up whichever grade led past the home. Still though, there were lots of hills in the area and they didn't all have nearly 200 year old houses at the top of them. Over the years, there were a few clues that began to emerge, such as the grave of a Revolutionary War veteran who had immigrated to the region at roughly the same time a few miles to the north, and the presence of an old post station a few miles south near a clear railroad embankment that hadn't been used in years. In fact, it was clear to me that the road that led from the intersection south to cross the Potato Creek that followed this old rail embankment, known as Piedmont Road as I said, was a good bit older than a lot of the stuff around it, showing up on maps going back into the 1800s. It was intriguing, but I lacked the knowledge to put it all together. That was until a couple of years ago when a friend of mine, Robert Jordan, showed me some research he was doing on discovering and mapping an old road in Jasper County, Georgia. Now Jasper County, for a long time, had once been the westernmost border of the United States with the Okmulgee River on its western boundary. The road that he was mapping, known as the Seven Islands Road, had served as a stagecoach and postal route through the region from northeast to southwest. In his research, Mr. Jordan had found that while the road had a rich and colorful history in the annals of the state of Georgia, it was actually much, much older than that, most likely predating the arrival of Europeans by hundreds, if not thousands of years. The Seven Islands Road it turned out, had mostly followed an old Native American trading route that connected the more northern Ofusky Trail that ran from near Charleston to a major trading point in what is now northwestern Alabama to a more southerly trail that included a stop at the native site known as the Okmulgee Mountains in Macon, Georgia. I was fortunate enough to get a chance to help Robert near the end of his research on that connecting trail explore and scout where it likely crossed the Okmulgee River at a point known as 40 Acre Island. My involvement in the project got me thinking about the old roads near where I like to ride my bike and the Gashett house again. I knew that Benjamin Gashett had died in 1829 as his gravestone was mere, a mere 100 yards from my home in Barnesville at the oldest cemetery on what had then been, you know, the outskirts of town. What I also learned was that Gashett had left behind a wife and six small children. To support themselves, Carolyn and her children continued to run the house as a stagecoach stop on what was becoming known as the Old Alabama Road that was being used to travel from the Carolinas into Creek Native Territory further to the south and west, territory that would eventually be incorporated into Georgia and Alabama. As you can probably guess, the similarity of the history of the Old Alabama Road to that of Mr. Jordan's Seven Islands Road got me wondering if this, too, had once been a cutoff that allowed native travelers and traders to move north and south between east-west routes across the region. 
While I have yet to find truly conclusive evidence of this, there are maps that show what is known as Keys Road as a stagecoach route that ran through the region. And Hempley's map of Native American trails in Georgia has an indication of an Indian trail that ran just east of the present-day Piedmont Road, known as the Coweta Falls Trail, that would have run from the Ofusky Trail down to a known trading site at the falls on the Chattahoochee River, just north of the present-day Columbus, Georgia. So I think it stands to reason that this old house was built alongside a travel route for European settlers that had been built in the tracks of a thousands of years old trail that had been traveled by foot instead of stagecoach. Now the house sits alongside a country road that once paralleled a railroad that carried cotton and peaches from rural communities to the manufacturing center in Barnesville and the main line there that connected it all to Atlanta, once known as Terminus, and Macon, eventually heading down to Savannah, Georgia. Roads built on older roads, built on even older roads. Each civilization walking in the footsteps of the one before it. Each new technology following the paths inscribed by an earlier means of transportation. I wonder how many of the people who drive their cars on a Sunday morning to attend services at the Mount Gap Church, near where Piedmont Road crosses the Potato Creek, know that their wheels turn down the same pathways that Native American traders would have walked, carrying goods from a tribe on the Gulf of Mexico to peoples who lived on the banks of the Okmulgee Shallows, or even further east, at the shoals of the Savannah River, to be traded for something of value there. Do they think of the old house they pass as a link, both in time and space, along those long-trodden ways. Roads connect people, traversing geography to bring closer what was once so far away. In this episode of the Odyssey, we will consider the role roads have played in the development of ancient civilizations and cultures, and continue to play in our lives today. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 5, Finding Our Way. Episode 9, All Roads Lead to Somewhere. So here we are, in the middle of thinking about the development of map making and geography, and I kind of think we've reached a transition point. We've arrived in our journey at a place where the Mediterranean has been brought together by that most famous of empires, Rome. Before this, map making and geography seems to have been primarily concerned with big picture, theoretical stuff, such as what kind of world humans lived on and what was their place in it. After this point, for a time, map making and geography will shift significantly towards more practical aspects, such as dividing up land for ownership, laying out towns and cities, and in the case of Rome, building the most extensive road network any polit political entity before or since has created. Therefore, I think it's a good time to take an episode to talk about the history of roads, what they are, where they come from, and a bit on how they're built and why they're important. In a way, this installment is a bit like the episode we did on metallurgy at the end of our History of the Atom series, a discussion of the development of a technology that is related to the broader topic, but that occurred in many respects separately from it, only to be folded in as the science caught up with the practice, or in this case, the engineering. So the first thing we should discuss is the answer to the question, what is a road? In my research, I've come across a good, pretty good physical definition, but to be honest, I find that definition quite a bit too limiting. The standard sort of thing I find referenced over and over again in source materials goes something like this. 
A road is a physical modification of a natural surface designed or constructed to improve travel across that surface for the purposes of facilitating or increasing the transportations of goods, the speed of communication, and the ease of individual travel. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the original name for these sorts of things, roads, comes from an ancient origin, and that origin is sort of related to the word for way, which is found in Middle English. This comes from the Latin veho, which means I carry, which can in turn be related to the Sanskrit word for carry, go, or move, va. The English word street, usually used these days to indicate an improved surface within an urban area, is derived from the Latin strata, which originally just meant layered and came to mean paved. As we will discuss, due to the advanced nature of Roman engineering and construction techniques and their implementation across the territories the empires conquered, it became common in Anglo-Saxon Britain to refer to all Roman roads as streets or strata due to their layered construction. And in other parts of Europe, for them to be known as highways due to the practice of building the roads above the lowest paths and build them in a way that had a raised center both innovations adopted to deal with water erosion and flooding. Finally, the word road itself seems to come from an old English word, rod, meaning to ride, which in Middle English became road or rada, raid, something like that, which indicated a mounted journey, something that would be taken along an improved surface whenever possible. Now all of this is well and good in as far as it goes, but I think it leaves out a lot of stuff. There's a broader metaphorical sense to the idea of a road, just as there is a broader metaphorical sense for what a map is. To stay in the realm of the physical, but moving away from actually hard, solid, mostly level surfaces, some of the very first and certainly longest lasting roads are actually waterways. While things like rivers, bays, and seas provide their own set of challenges to travel and transport, they were likely among the earliest and most common use forms of conveyance. Here in the United States, so much of the country's history and growth is shaped by its waterways or those it has shared with other nations. Whether it be the St. Lawrence River on the northern boundary, the long, deep southern rivers such as the Savannah, Altamaha, and Delaware rivers that enter and empty into the Atlantic, or perhaps, most importantly, the Mississippi River system that encompasses much of what is commonly referred to as the heartland these days. These rivers served as roads long before anything that looked much like a traditional road was developed by the European newcomers in the early 19th century. The same is true, I think, in every culture and every place where civilization has first arisen. If you think about it, almost all of the great first civilizations we learn about came about in conjunction with rivers. Now, of course, much of this had to do with ready sources of available fresh water for irrigation for domesticated plant species. But there is, I think, an important role those rivers also played in being able to move people up and down along a reliable and accessible thoroughfare. However, there is also much beyond the physical that one can contemplate when thinking about roads. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, it was commonplace to talk about an internet superhighway, a developed infrastructure that communities and individuals could access to participate in the increasing flow and availability of information housed on computer servers. I remember a great deal of consternation about who did and didn't have access and how that so-called digital divide could be bridged by the way, another road metaphor, so that those in poorer or more rural parts of the world could have a chance to drive on the superhighway, a divide, I should note, that has not been fully bridged even in some of the world's most developed economies. What, ama what is amazing now is how, in such a short period of time, this new digital road has facilitated commerce, revolutionized communication, and altered patterns of travel. As a personal example of this, here recently, with the arrival of winter in Flagstaff, I decided that it would be wise to buy a set of emergency chains. For those not familiar with this device, tire chains are, well, literally that. Links of chain or cables, configured to wrap around the tires of an automobile more or less snugly, snugly to provide additional traction in slick, snowy, or icy conditions. 
Now, I've had sets of chains for other vehicles I've owned, but having spent nearly 20 years in the American Southeast, where, the, where snow is an increasingly rare event, I no longer owned any. There, it was just easier to plan ahead based on forecasts and enjoy the rare occasion when the white stuff fell from the skies without having to deal with the stress of traveling in it. However, if one lives in a place where the snow and ice stick around for a while after it falls, or if one runs the risk of running into a lot of winter weather while traveling, chains are a wise thing to add to an emergency travel kit. Thus, as the first indications of a major snowstorm began to appear in the long-term forecast here at 7,000 feet on the Colorado Plateau, I headed out to buy a set for my car. Much to my surprise, however, I couldn't find any at any of the retail outlets I visited, places that 20 years ago would have carried many such sets to fit a variety of different tire sizes. In each case, the person behind the counter told me that they no longer carried change on site, but that I could easily visit their company's retail website to peruse their selection there, make an order, and have them shipped to me in a couple of days. The virtual superhighway had, and has, fundamentally changed the nature of commerce in this particular sector of the marketplace, in some ways for the better, and in others, I think, for the worse. The rise of companies like Amazon, not to mention the online storefronts of most major traditional retailers, would not have been possible without this new type of road network, the digital superhighway of the Internet. Finally, to think of roads in a fully metaphorical way, I'm reminded of a teaching tool I learned during my period of theological self-education. In American evangelicalism, there are a set of theological beliefs regarding how a person can obtain or achieve, if those are even the best terms, salvation. In order to teach these ideas to those either new to the faith or exploring it from another faith perspective, a sort of simple catechism or teaching tool was developed. Taken from the writings of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the congregation at Rome, this fairly linear approach is represented as steps along a path dubbed the Roman Road. In this metaphor, there is no physical infrastructure or medium, but rather the implication is that a way has been discovered that has indicated the correct direction, eliminated all the possible wrong turns a, you know, a seeker of faith can take, and smoothed out the bumps and made the end goal significantly more accessible. I think if you go into the self-help section of any book retailer, physical or virtual, and you'll likely find any number of offerings across a variety of areas, from dieting to healthy living to relationship improvement to business success, that, that will use this same road metaphor to encourage you to consider their particular package of knowledge and skills. Thus, as was the case with mapping, where we realized that the idea of a map applied to this broad set of co cultural concepts, so too this is the case in roads. Therefore, as we go forward in this episode, while we will be focusing on that first definition of what a road is, please keep in the back of your mind the truth that the idea of a road applies much more broadly, and I think, with a bit of creativity and with great profit, to a number of other areas of human activity. Just as with our early conversations of mapping, there are times when the metaphorical is just as, if not even more, relevant than the physical. In this light, let us consider the words of Li Haiku. Musing, I shut my eyes, and I think of the road I have come. If you wish to know whether society is stagnant, religion a dead formality, you may learn something by going into the universities and libraries. Something also by the work that is doing on in cathedrals and churches. Or in theme, but quite as much by looking at the roads. For if there is any motion in society, the road, which is a symbol of motion, will indicate the fact. When there is activity or enlargement, or a liberalizing spirit of any kind, then there is intercourse and travel, and these require roads. So if there is any kind of advancement going on, if new ideas are abroad and new hopes rising, then you will see it by the roads that are building. 
Nothing makes an inroad without making a road. All creative action, whether in government, industry, thought, or religion, creates roads. Horace Bushnell So, with our definition and delineation of the subject matter for this episode stated, let's take a bit of a look at the history of roads. As is the case with this in the making of maps, the origin of roads and road building seems to be lost in the midst of time. While there's a lot of uncertainty, the most common hypothesis I've been able to find seems to be a sort of progression from game trails to walking trails to worn pathways and then on to organized attempts to improve on these using a variety of means. Taking these steps one at a time, the thinking goes that as nomadic hunter-gatherer peoples migrated into a region, they would have likely used game trails as their first paths through the landscape. Whether these were made by animals moving singularly or in small groups, as might be the case with deer, elk, or bear, or in large herds, such as gazelle or bison, these trails would likely have followed the easiest paths between sites having resources useful for survival, such as water. Additionally, they would have followed the routes of easiest egress, avoiding steep climbs, harsh rock fields, and overly dense vegetation. In this model, travelers, skilled in wayfinding, would have been able to follow these sometimes ephemeral paths, though, as you might surmise, it wouldn't take as much skill to discern the ways made by thousands of bison across the North American plains as it would to wind through the old-growth forest of the American Southeast along a deer trail. Yet, what seems to be the case is that these hunter-gatherer tribes began to travel along these routes. More and more consistently, the game trails became something more. As we mentioned in an earlier episode, the paths created would be woven into song and dance, and each succeeding generation would learn the ways of their ancestors through whatever landscape they resided in. In the words of A.B. Hurlburt, in his work, the Old National Road, Historic Highways of American Paths of Inland Commerce. He writes, quote, The buffalo, because of its sagacious selection of the most sure and the most direct courses, has influenced the routes of trade and travel of the white race as much, possibly, as he influenced the course of the red men in earlier days. There is great truth in Thomas Benton's figure when he said that the buffalo blazed the ra- way of the railways to the Pacific. That sagacious animal undoubtedly blazed with his hooves on the surface of the earth the course of many of our roads, canals, and railroads. That he found the points of least resistance across our great mountain ranges, there can be little doubt. It is certain that he discovered Cumberland Gap, and his route through that pass in the mountains has been accepted as one of the most important on the continent. It is also obvious that the buffalo found the course from the Atlantic waters to the head of the great Kanawha, and that he opened the way from the Potomac to the Ohio. In a host of instances, our highways and railroads follow for many miles the great line of the routes of the buffalo and Indian on the high ground. This is particularly true of our roads of secondary importance, country roads, in which hundreds of instances follow the alignment of a pioneer road which was laid out on an Indian trail. End quote. In this way, just as animals would have sought the easiest pathways over and through terrain and vegetation, be that through the lowest passages through the mountains, the shallowest fords across streams and rivers, and the most solid paths through swampy areas, so too would travelers have found similar routes. One modern way to think of this might be a mountain bike trail that is slowly worn in and developed over time as more and more riders follow the tracks of those who have gone before them. With each repeated passage along the same track, the soil becomes more packed down a bit and the trail grows wider and more discernible. As obstacles appear, things such as tree falls or when water runoff damages or blocks a trail, the usage reroutes the worn path to accommodate the change. Moreover, riders with differing ability or fitness levels may choose different routes depending on those and other factors leading to a series of trails for the beginner and expert alike. So too the trail systems of our early travelers. 
A number of anthropologists suggest that in many places where the terrain would have been varied and the risk of attack low, braided systems of trails might have developed with common intersection points at important sites such as trading locations, caves, water crossings, and that sort of thing. A hardy young member of a tribe or clan would have no problem climbing up and over an intervening hill, whereas a mother or family or family with small children or elderly members of a tribe might choose to go around the hill on a longer but easier path. Mobility on foot would have allowed such variation to take place. However, as domestication of plants and animals began, this pattern would have altered itself to take into account the greater loads being carried or transported, as well as new developments in technology. Driven by this development of domestication and the need to transport goods from field to the developing urban centers, various type of sleds were developed to help in this transport. These sleds, along with increased animal traffic, served to both widen and smooth out our earlier footpaths, as well as preferentially select those with gentler grades. The earliest paths of this sort that we've been able to find and have been able to document are situated near the ancient city of Jericho and date to sometime around 6000 BCE. Undoubtedly though, there are trails that go much earlier than this. While there would have been many of these types of sled design technologies, and you know, those would have all been very important, none of them would have been as important in the development of roads and road technologies as was the case with the addition of the wheel to sleds. Perhaps beginning with the use of rolling logs to help in the transport of heavy stones across a landscape, though I have to say there's been much doubt cast on this hypothesis in recent times. The wheel did much to determine which of the older pathways would see greater use. In places where the grade was too steep or too rough, those pathways would, still f would soon fall into disuse, while the ways over flatter terrain and smoother sort of, you know, pathways those roads or those pathways would grow wider. There would be a problem, however. When the ground is flat, flooding becomes a much greater concern. Thus, it is in these sorts of situations that the first improvements to the pathways are going to be made, and that, that those improvements are probably the first things that we call roads. The earliest examples archaeologists have uncovered of constructed roadways can be found in a number of places. These include the city of Ur in modern-day Iraq, dating to around 4000 BCE, where city streets were paved with stone. A swamp near Glastonbury, England, where we find a series of tree trunks laid side by side through a swamp to facilitate travel, dating to about 3300 BCE. And in the Indus civilization in Sindh and Punjab, where burnt bricks were used to pave streets specifically designed to facilitate water drainage in the period between about 3250 BCE and 2750 BCE. With the rise of metallurgical technologies that would produce harder and more durable metal tools around 3000 BCE, stone cutting and working became significantly more feasible. And one of the consequences of this technological development was the ability to build better roads over much longer distances. No longer were improvements limited to either the streets of urban areas or the places where rivers and swamps were to be crossed as was the case with the Amber Roads, a vast network of trade routes that developed in Europe during this period. Instead, wealthy societies could now construct long roads that would connect important points within their empires or kingdoms. Perhaps the best example of this is the 50 kilometer long roadway built on Crete by the Minoans to carry people and goods over the mountains of the island in around 2000 BCE, though I have to tell you I've been having a really hard time finding a solid date for what is generally known as the oldest existing paved road in the world. Rising to an elevation of over 5300 imperial feet or about 1300 meters, the 12 foot wide thoroughfare ran from Gortina in the south on the south coast of the island to Gnosis on the north shore, crossing those intervening mountains. The road was constructed by layering stone of various sizes, and more importantly, by raising the center of the roadway to facilitate the shedding of water. The topmost layer, the pavement, a word by the way taken from pave, which is French for large stone, consisted of large sandstone pieces bound together by a mortar made of clay and gypsum. 
Running down the center of that pavement were two rows of ultra-durable tracks made out of basaltic paving stones that were about two inches thick, and those were presumably intended for cart traffic. A number of sources I've read note that this road exceeds in terms of engineering and construction anything anyone would have built for thousands of years, and yes, that does include the, the roads built by the Romans. What's also true is that the road was probably enormously expensive to build, and it reflects in a very profound and foundational way the wealth of the Minoan Empire at its height two millennia before the fall of the Roman Republic, a conclusion more starkly underlined by the fact that when classical Greek civilization ro arose on the Peloponnese to the north of Crete a few hundred years later, Road construction was not an activity that any of the city-states there invested in outside of their walls of their, you know, central urban areas. They just didn't have the resources that the Minoan Empire had. In Mesopotamia, there was road building on a less elaborate but much larger scale. Probably the most famous road in the region was known as the Royal Road, as it was underwritten by the great kings of the various empires of the region. Originally dating to sometime around 3500 BCE, the path from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean began as little more than a trading track. Not unlike the Seven Islands Road, Robert Jordan has spent his time and energy documenting in Georgia. Followed only by those who knew its ways, traders and guides, it was more formally organized and operated by the Assyrians in around 1200 BCE. In this iteration, a good way for my North American listeners to conceptualize this might be something like the Pony Express route in the middle of the 19th century before the construction of the first transcontinental railroad. This track, or path, or whatever you want to call it, would have been more than just a simple path along most of its length, but less than what we might think of as a road except when it came to military installations and urban areas. Nevertheless, the track if we were to pick a term for the thing between path and road, had stations situated along its length for use by government officials and other customers willing to pay for the services they offered. By the 6th century BCE, the Persian king Cyrus II and Darius I invested more money into the 1,500-mile route, bringing it up to a standard that allowed royal riders, as they were called, to travel the distance in a surprisingly short 20 days. Herodotus reports that for those less privileged travelers who thought to traverse the length of the road, the time was probably closer to 90 days to travel from Susa to Arbella to Nineveh, which by the way is the ultimate destination for the prophet Jonah, to the caravan and trade center in Haran, and finally to the end points of the route in Asia Minor at either Smyrna or Ephesus. The pace for this would still have been a respectable 16 or so miles a day if one were to travel every day with a pack animal loaded with goods. In Egypt, there is evidence of road building at around 2600 to 2200 BCE south of Cairo, likely as an aid to dragging sleds of various types used for construction, both monumental and religious, and the transportation of goods, as the wheel wouldn't arrive in the kingdom of the Nile until around 1600 BCE. While there is little indication that roads were paved in typical urban areas, it is clear that paving was used along processional paths or roads leading to various temples. I would imagine that both in Egypt and in other places where this was employed, the psychological effect would have been enormous. Imagine that you are a pilgrim who has traveled some number of days and miles along dusty and dirty roads, or paths even. Upon your arrival at your destination, you are greeted with not only massive and monumental temples to the gods, but also these paved roadways, clean and smooth, that carry your tired body towards the object of your religious devotion. The effect would have been to enhance the feeling that you were being transported into another world, a better, more orderly place that was eternal, untroubled by the ordinary cares and woes of everyday life. Just as the cathedrals in medieval Europe thought to elevate the minds of the faithful, so too did the temple roads of Egypt seek to alter the consciousness of those coming to worship their deities. In addition to these limited paved roads, there were unpaved but still improved roads running both parallel to the Nile and east-west. There is evidence of major east-west trade routes that ran from Thebes, to Coptos, Thebes and Coptos to the Red Sea and from Cairo up to Asia Minor. 
These roads, by the way, were used all throughout history, up to and including the battles between Montgomery and Rommel in World War II. Finally, if we were to just sort of take our tour of the world to one more stop, in China, road development likely began in parallel with what has been found in India and Mesopotamia, but there's little evidence of extensive formal development before about 300 BCE. It is at this time that the famous Silk Road was first organized, and from then on there would be significant governmental investment in road development by the in Emperor Xing Hongdi. These roads would, much like the Roman contemporaries, be wide, well-engineered, and relatively smoothed. Surfaced with stone and often lined with trees, they covered a variety of terrains. Over the course of the next 1,000 years, some 25,000 miles of good roads would be constructed, a feat that is exceeded only by the Roman Empire, perhaps the most ambitious road builders until the 20th century. Thousands line the road in this annual rite of spring, cheering their larger-than-life heroes, urging, at times even helping them to victory. They ride in the tracks of bygone legends, dreaming of distant fame and glory. But glory is not without a price. These bloodied and battered warriors struggle through the rain, the cold, the mud, on roads better suited to oxen cart than bicycles. But for the victor, there is glory, immortality, and a place in history among the giants of the road. Since 1896, the greatest bicycle racers on earth have come to test their very souls in this brutal and beautiful spectacle. CBS Sports, April 1987. In April of every year, since 1896, with the exception of the years of the two world wars, there is a bicycle race that runs from Paris to the provincial city in northern France on the border of Belgium called Roubaix. There, in a stadium for racing bicycles known as a velodrome that was constructed by two textile manufacturers a few years earlier, the leaders of the 260 kilometer or 160 mile race will ride three laps who de to determine who will claim that year's victory and forever be known as the champion of one of cycling's five monuments. While impressive, it is not the distance of the event that makes it formidable, nor is it some great feat of climbing that elevates it above the other would-be spectacles of the sport. What makes Paris-Roubaix perhaps the most gripping one-day bicycle race in the world are the roads it runs across. Beginning 100 kilometers into the event, the riders turn onto the first of 19 sectors, as they are called, of pave, or in more modern terms, cobblestone roads. Now, to be clear, these are not the small cobblestones one might see in a town or city center, placed to make the roads and sidewalks more charming, laid smoothly and ev evenly to facilitate transportation, though those were roads were more, once more like that. No, these cobbles, as they are known, are large stone blocks that the centuries of cycles of freeze and thaw have caused to heave and crack. Once laid so that they would provide an even surface, the forces of nature have jumbled up those once smooth pathways so that today, in the words of the American cyclist Chris Horner, quote, the best I could do would be to describe it like this. They plowed a dirt road, flew it over it with a helicopter, and then just dropped a bunch of rocks out of the helicopter. That's Perry roubaix It's that bad. It's ridiculous. End quote. While some of these roads only date back to the Middle Ages, several of them hark back to a period much, much earlier, when the might of the Roman Empire reigned over the entirety of Gaul, from the Mediterranean at Marseille to Antwerp on the North Sea in Belgium. And across this vast territory of Europa, named for one of Jupiter's lovers, the Romans did what they did everywhere they went. They built roads. Recognizing that one of the best ways to pacify an area was to bring civilization and order to it, 
often at the tip of a spear, the sons of Romulus connected the urban centers of first Gaul and then Britannia with roads befitting the best engineered empire in history to that time, and it should be said for some time thereafter. So well engineered and built, in fact, were these roads that some 1,800 years after, the riders of the first race from Paris rode north much of their route on that pave or pavement laid down by Roman military units. While much of this was paved over after the Second World War by town mayors afraid of having their towns look too backwards and undevelopment, undeveloped when TV cameras came along, there are still a few sections of cobbles that have been preserved. So brutal are these to ride across that the Irishman Sean Kelly, who won the 1984 edition of the race, commented, quote, Perry Roubaix is a horrible race to ride, but the most beautiful one to win, end quote. So how was it that these roads were able to survive, often in rough conditions over such a long period and through two world wars? The short answer is that no one engineered like the Romans did. As with so many things, the Romans began with knowledge obtained from other civilizations around them, integrated that, and then, proved, and then improved on it over and over and over again until they had a superior way of doing things. In the case of road building, the evidence points to the source of their know-how being the Etruscan civilization to their north, especially when it came to making and using cement. To this, they added the, the knowledge of masonry that they got from the Greeks in southern Italy. And then, the layering and water drainage from the Cretans, as we've talked about already, and pavement making from the Carthaginians, who were great road builders in their own right, the little remains to attest to their skill and ambition. As was often the case in the ancient world, the initial impetus for road construction was not so much to facilitate trade and commerce, but rather to support military operations. This is evident in the first truly grand road the Romans built, the Via Appia, or Appian Way. Eventually running some 410 miles, the first constructed section, built during the Second Samnite War in 312 BCE, was created to facilitate travel of men and supplies from Rome to Capua in order to support ongoing warfare. Over the centuries, the road was extended and expanded on to continue to Beneventum and Brundisium on the Adriatic coast before ending up in Hydruntum. It would be in this project, especially early on, that Roman engineers would test and perfect most of the later technologies that would be employed in their road construction. We'll talk about Roman surveying in a later episode, but Roman roads tended to run from point to point by line of sight in a straight line traversing all manner of natural obstacles from swamps to rivers to ravines. So confident were the Romans in their ability to engineer a solution to whatever obstacles that faced them that they just built whatever they needed to keep the road as straight as possible, knowing that the concrete and stoneworks they created would be able to withstand any use or could be quickly replaced by something that would. This is documented by Plutarch, who writes, quote, They, meaning the roads, were driven straight across country, regardless of obstacles, paved with smooth stone and strengthened with mounds of rammed earth. The hollows were filled, the torrents and ravines which cut the line of the road spanned by bridges, so that the height on each side was the same, and the whole work had a regular and elegant appearance. End quote. This would be especially true during the age of the Antonines, where beginning with Trajan until the Antonine Plague, the emperors would invest enormous resources in ex into extending the road network, while also encouraging the Roman elites in the provinces to pony up their fair share as well especially in the construction of secondary or provincial roads. Architects and engineers were kept busy in all parts of the empire, planning and constructing bridges, causeways, ramparts, and even lengthy tunnels to overcome nature's impediments so that goods and people could move quickly through the lands the empire controlled and taxed. It's certainly fair to say that this road network, durable and well-maintained, formed a foundational pillar of the Roman economy in addition to serving its original military purpose. In this, there are many parallels with the construction and utilization of the U.S. interstate highway system, proposed first during the Eisenhower administration to facilitate the moment of movement of troops and equipment so that the nation could fight a two-ocean war, but now used in transporting goods and materials from coastal harbors to all points inland. So what went into making a Roman road 
a Roman road. The basic structure of a full-fledged Roman road was two parallel trenches dug about 40 feet apart in order to facilitate the drainage of water. The material from these trench ditches would be piled up in the space in between them to form a foundation for a road that could be as thick as three feet, thus raising the roadbed well above the level of the surrounding ground. Now, if the road wasn't very important, that's probably all that would be done. But if it were to support either heavier traffic or be designed as a via militares or military road, then additional improvements were made. The first of these was to cover the embankment with a layer of sand. On top of this were constructed two additional layers, each with a different size of rock or stone. Covering this was something called the nucleus layer, which was made from a concrete consisting of coarse sand, small gravel, and a kind of cement. If the road were very important, this nucleus layer would then be covered with a pavement surface known as summum dorsum consisting of large stone slabs of at least six inches of thickness that were fitted tightly together enough that the seams were nearly indistinguishable. This wearing surface could withstand a high level of cart and horse traffic. To keep all of this in place, there would be constructed curbs, usually about 18 inches high and two feet wide on each side of the road surface, with drains at regular intervals. As stated previously, the exemplar of this type of road was the Appian Way, which was about 35 feet wide and between 3 and 6 feet thick in total construction. Along the main road surface were constructed two one-way lanes that were 7 feet wide that served to facilitate foot and horse traffic. As you might imagine from the description, the cost to build such roads was enormous. While it's always tricky to estimate monetary conversions over such long time periods, one estimate I found puts the price tag for a military road built to the standards of the Appian Way at over 5, 000, or 5 million U.S. dollars per mile in today's money, a number comparable to the construction costs of a modern four to six lane interstate highway. To get a sense of the scale of such construction, a survey taken to the during the 2nd century CE Golden Age of the Roman Empire, known as the Itinerary of Antonine, lists the length of the road built to the standards of the Appian Way of being around 53,000 miles. This would have required an investment of over $250 billion in today's money. To again compare this to the U.S. interstate highway system, often referred to as one of the seven wonders of the modern world, the total length of U.S. interstates is about 43,000 miles, and it was constructed at a cost of $128 billion. And just to be clear, this price tag does not count the empire's secondary roads, those lacking that topmost layer of heavy paving stones and raised curbs. These somewhat lesser roads would have cost on the order of $2 million per mile today and would likely have totaled an equal number of miles in terms of total construction length. As a comparison, these would have been roughly equivalent to what it would take to build a three or four lane, say, state route or highway from scratch, though these days that's rarely done as older roads are usually improved by either widening or resurfacing them. In addition to building roads that were engineered to be permanent just in construction methods, the Romans also changed the way the roads were routed. While the roads might follow older paths, such as those amber trading routes we mentioned earlier through Europe, especially when connecting urban areas or crossing rivers at fordable points, they often avoided the older lowland ways from the days when sleds were dragged. Recognizing that water damage endured by these routes would lead to enormous maintenance overhead, the Romans built their roads along or near ridge lines whenever possible, thus leading to the term highway. Nevertheless, these higher pathways were still constructed so as to not be too steep, and when curves on the road were required, every attempt was made to lay the roads so that the more heavily laden carts being pulled by teams of ten horses could navigate them with ease. As such, loaded carts could easily move along these roads at 15 to 20 miles per day, while post riders, moving quickly and changing horses every couple of hours, could cover 75 miles a day if necessary. As Rome moved away from being an empire just near the shores of the Mediterranean to a vast overland collection of provinces, these roads would have been its lifeblood, transporting goods, people, and was often the case with the Romans' armies, rapidly and reliably. The popular saying was and is that all roads lead to Rome, 
But as Herbert Reinhold Jacobson pointed out in his 1940 master's thesis, it may be just as accurate to say that all roads led from Rome. In his words, quote, It is commonly said that all roads led to Rome. Rather, it would seem more appropriate to say that all roads led from Rome. For nothing so forcibly visualized her power, her glory, and her grandeur as did these lifelines, reaching outwards in all directions to encompass, protect, and foster the interchange of trade and ideas. The heart was Rome, but the arteries were the roads carrying the lifeblood of an empire to the remotest member of the body politic. The world did not come to Rome. Rome went to the world, and this by the ever-expanding network of roads, built not to serve as avenues of conquest, but after victory had been accomplished. It is not because of the wealth that flowed into her coffers that Rome lives in history, but because of the enforcement of law, the encouragement of commerce, the interchange of knowledge which flowed away from Rome. Over these roads spread a civilization of such breadth and depth that although politically Rome is dead, Intellectually, she still lives and continues to influence us through her law, her language, and her literature. End quote. While there are many factors that contributed to Rome's success as a lasting political entity, it is hard to imagine the empire growing as quickly and reaching as far as it did without the high quality road network it invested in, a network still traveled across each spring by the world's most talented cyclists. It's at this point that I kind of like to bring this episode to a close. While there is still much to be said about the history of roads and road construction, something I hope to cover in later episodes, I believe that this introduction, which brings us to the same period we were at in our discussion of geography and cartography, serves to sort of carve out the central role roads have played in human activities. In the case of Roman roads, while there aren't a lot of maps of the road system from the period contemporary to their construction still extant, those that we do have clearly show the scope and importance they played in imagining an empire more vast than any the Mediterranean had known. What we do know from written accounts is that the construction of the various, various roads throughout the empire required a good deal of surveying and mapping on a scale fundamentally different than that undertaken by those involved in the early Greek and Hellenistic traditions. While theoretical cartography and geography was practiced up through the 2nd century CE in intellectual and academic centers in the Roman Empire, the much larger amount of activity related to mapping turned to tasks more practical to the running of an empire. In our next episode, we'll take some time to look at those things in more detail. As a closing thought, though, I hope you'll allow me to expand and editorialize a bit on the parallel between the road systems of those great empires we've discussed and those being built and used now by the great economies of the West. To recall our quote from earlier in the episode, one way to gauge the health of a civilization might be to make an account of the investment in infrastructure projects, most notably in roads and the structures that accompany them, bridges, tunnels, overpasses, etc. When one examines each of the Mediterranean Mesopotamian empires, one sees that those that were healthy, growing, and thriving took some portion of their resources and invested them in the road systems that they had. When embroiled in political conflict and civil war, besieged by plague and famine, or given over to cultural malaise, those resources were diverted to other priorities, often to the detriment of the long-term sustainability of the society. Here in the United States, we invested a significant number of resources to develop transportation infrastructure over our various periods of growth. First through enabling better transport of goods on waterways, then by rail, and after the Second World War by developing the world's greatest road network. There can be no question that without these investments, the United States would likely have remained a second-rate provincial economy, and its people much more mired in cycles of poverty. 
As with the great empires of old, such grand projects could not have been realized without initiation and coordination of needed expertise and resources on a national level. Whether that be the creation of the Cumberland Highway in the post-colonial period, the development of the transcontinental rail lines in the 1860s and 70s, or Eisenhower's interstate system. And yet, in the United States, we find ourselves at a crossroads when it comes to these investments. The American Society of Civil Engineers has, over the last several years, given the country's infrastructure very poor marks, while pointing out that thousands of bridges and roads are in poor enough condition that their functionality could well be dangerously compromised. The solutions to these problems, however, are not particularly mysterious. It's not as if there is some sort of concrete blight that we don't have a cure for that's infecting the pillars of our overpasses and highways. What afflicts our infrastructure are merely the ravages of time that all road, road builders back to the Minoans and Mesopotamians have had to deal with. Water and ice, heat and cold, wear and tear. And as they learned, and the Romans accounted for, the only solution for the inevitable decay of any piece of infrastructure is maintenance and replacement. Things that are well understood, but that also call for continuous, ongoing investment. In the United States, I think it's safe to say that our culture of innovation, long a part of our national intellectual and cultural fabric, has become, at least in this instance, part of the problem. No one gets a lot of credit or kudos for keeping the roads well maintained and the buses and trains running on time. These days, we laud CEOs and politicians who develop and support new technologies and new entertainments to the exclusion of those who keep what we have in good order. As a result, we divert some of the resources once used for the maintenance of our roads to newer and more exciting projects. Yet, as a number of economists have recently noted, Rome's greatness as a political entity had a lot more to do with good roads and functioning sewer systems than it did with generating the quote-unquote next big thing registered trademark. More pernicious, pernicious than that, however, is the idea that many have that the investments made by their parents and grandparents are theirs to reap the rewards from without having to leave something for their children and grandchildren. The slashing of taxes the public contribution to the necessary investments to maintain existing infrastructure, has contributed to this precipitous decline in the reliability of roads, bridges, and all the rest. Politicians respond to the short-term demands of the electorate to put more back in their pockets without explaining the long-term ramifications of such decisions. As the citizens of states such as Kansas, Louisiana, and others know, the rating of highway funds to cover governmental costs created by irresponsible tax policy has left a legacy of broken roads and lost opportunities. What will all of those Teslas drive on if the infrastructure they require crumbles? How will all the goods and materials being brought into the new, deeper coastal ports such as Savannah make it to consumers or factories if the transportation infrastructure they require to be moved isn't maintained and improved along with the harbors? How will people get to and from work safely and expeditiously if roads are congested and overstressed due to a lack of infrastructure investment? While the building of new roads can, at times, go from being unnecessary to ridiculous, see the infamous bridge to nowhere, there is no good excuse for the neglect of already existing roadways. If our parents and grandparents could afford to build them, we can afford to maintain them that, so that our children's and grandchildren's opportunities will be as robust as our own have been. Finally, the present political gridlock of a nation and increasingly a world dominated by tribalism and factionalism that will not allow the other side to have any sort of victory does not bode well for the allocation of public resources to a public good. In the United States, there has long been talk of infrastructure bills in the national and state legislative bodies for a number of years. While agreed upon as being both good and necessary by all parties, these have often been held up by nothing more than political wrangling, gamesmanship, and obstructionism. It is far past time that the electorate demand, at the ballot box, that their elected officials set aside partisan differences to get things done. The economies of empires, both past and present, are predicated on good infrastructure, and if the electorates of the Western democracies cannot get past these impediments, they may well soon find themselves struggling to maintain the standards of living and quality of life they have now, much less those they aspire to. 
It seems to me that in this realm, at least, we must continue to make public investments and elect those who are committed to doing so. It is clear that the emerging and competing economies of the world are willing to invest in such priorities and, as, his, as history has demonstrated, are beginning to and will continue to reap the benefits of doing so. I hope that you will forgive my short foray, foray into editorializing here. While I know that there are dozens of issues competing for all of our attention, a situation, by the way, your navigator finds just as exhausting as you all likely do, it stands to reason that if the foundational, foundational elements of a society are allowed to rot, all of the other stuff doesn't matter much. As an example, you can develop a way to provide health care access to a greater number of citizens, but if the medicines and health care providers can't get to those in need, what's the benefit of such an innovation? Anyways, as always, thanks for taking the time to listen to the show. I'm deeply appreciative of the fact that you take a bit of your time out of your busy life to listen to and consider my thoughts. If you know someone who might enjoy the content we're creating, I hope you'll invite them to join our crew. There's always room for another curious explorer here on The Odyssey. To those who have subscribed to the show recently or who have found this episode through some sort of a search, welcome aboard. If you're liking the vistas we sail towards, please leave a review on whatever service you're using so that more folks will hear about the show. Thanks also to the Blue Dot Sessions, who have composed the music that is the soundtrack for our journey. You can find their music by doing a simple internet search on their name. It's wonderfully varied, and I think you'll find very much to enjoy there. Until next time, full sails on your journey.